Welcome to this podcast on pharmacokinetic modeling, otherwise known as PK modeling. And we'll start our conversation about pharmacokinetic modeling by uh, providing a couple definitions. Basically, a model is a hypothesis that uses mathematical terms to describe quantitative or measurable relationships. And what we're trying to do in pharmacokinetic modeling is to mathematically represent a organism such as a human body and be able to try different ways of medicating or dosing that particular patient to see what effects that would have in terms of getting the drug into the body, what happened to the drug in the body, and getting the drug out of the body. Uh, this modeling requires a pretty thorough knowledge of anatomy and physiology. It also requires an understanding of the concepts and limitations of mathematical models. And we're going to make a lot of assumptions in this model about what's happening in the body. And we have to do that for simplicity's uh, sake. It is possible for these models to get very complicated very quickly. Uh, the models we're going to ask you to build for this particular uh, week's activity is a really pretty simple model, um, and, but it's useful. Um, all models, uh, there's a great saying by George Box, who was an industrial statistician, all models are wrong, some are useful, and the model that we're going to ask you to build this week for lab is a, a very simple model that's going to be wrong, but it's at the same time uh, pretty useful, so we'll go ahead with that. Um, Basically what we want to do, our outcome here, is to develop some mathematical equations that describe a drug concentration in the body as a function of time. And notice, by the way, we care really about drug concentration, not the amount of drug. And think about what the difference of that might be. If I give 600 milligrams of drug to a person that's 300 pounds and 600 milligrams of drug to a person that's 100 pounds, who has more drug in their body? Well, the answer is they both have the same amount of drug in their body. They both have 600 milligrams of drug. And, but obviously, 600 milligrams for a 300-pounder is going to have a very different effect than 600 milligrams for a 100-pound patient. It's the concentration of drug or the amount of drug divided by the volume that we're really going to care about. Okay, we'll get into that. So how are we going to do this? Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to fit the model to uh, some experimental data known as variables. And particularly what we're going to be looking at here are some pharmacokinetic parameters. Those are the variables that we're primarily going to be focusing on here. And a, the, the PK mathematics or the PK function basically relates an independent variable to a dependent variable. And the simplest example is the independent variable will be the amount of drug that we're giving the patient, and the dependent variable is almost always going to be the concentration of drug in the blood, okay? And keeping in mind it's concentration, not amount, and that's a critical thing that you're going to have to remember. All right, here's a picture that you've seen before, ADME, the fate of drug in the body. Uh, there are four different ways to get drugs into a body. We can give the, the medication orally, that's called oral administration. It obviously goes to the gastrointestinal tract. Some of that drug in the GI tract will immediately be excreted. It won't even get into the blood. It will go right into, right through the kidneys and right out into the bladder and, and then get excreted. Uh, some of that, and this is what you've been looking at a little bit with things like log P and some of those other values, uh, solubility, some of those things. Some of that drug will go from the GI tract and get into the circulatory system. Some of the drug will actually come from the blood system, circulatory system, and get back into the GI tract. So you see that pathway there. Um, uh, we can also uh, put a drug in intravenously or IV injection. And of course, that means the drug is going directly into the circulatory system. Uh, we can put the drug in IM or intramuscular. Uh, we can inject it into the muscle. I'm sure a lot of you have had drugs uh, that have been put into your arm before, right into the muscle, hurts a little bit. And we can also have subcutaneous or sub-Q injection right under the skin. Uh, notice IM and sub-Q injections get into the tissues directly, and then they absorb and are distributed into the circulatory system, 
and go out from there. From the circulatory system, notice that uh, all drugs go to some metabolic site. That site typically is the liver and eventually gets excreted. So the end point of all drugs is they get excreted. But this is a really pretty good graphic that sort of captures the four different ways of getting drugs into the body and uh, what happens to them, their fate and distribution after they uh, get into the appropriate spot. Okay, the complexity of a pharmacokinetic model will vary with the route of administration, the extent and duration of distribution in the various body fluids and tissues, uh, the process of elimination, and the intended application of the PK model. And the saying at the bottom is true, we always choose the simplest model. We want to build a model that will help us e explore the behavior of the drug, but that is not overly complicated. And the model we're going to ask you to build this week will be the simplest pharmacokinetic model we can possibly build. Uh, we're going to put some drug into the stomach. It's going to get into the blood. We're going to measure its concentration. And we're going to see how that affects uh, taking care of the patient. Uh, there's various types of PK models. There's called what's called a physiological or perfusion model. Uh, there's basically what's, what's known as a compartmental model. And there are mammillary models. We'll talk about each one of these very briefly here. Uh, physiological PK models are based on known physiologic and anatomic data, um, and it's the blood flow that's responsible for getting the drug to the various parts of the uh, body. We have to know the volume of every tissue system, so for example, um, the liver, the kidneys, the blood, uh, the muscle tissue, all of these volumes must be obtained, and the drug concentration in all of those tissues uh, described. Um, and we use these models to try to predict realistic tissue drug concentrations. Um, and we apply these models to animal species. Uh, so basically, we, we actually measure some of the stuff in the lab. And then when we build the model, we try to make sure the lab, excuse me, the uh, PK model will um, uh, replicate what we're seeing in the lab. And then what we do is we extrapolate or assume that the, the animal model behaves like the human does, and we can extrapolate um, what's going to happen in a human. So, for example, we can build a model uh, of, of a mouse. We can inject the drug into the mouse. We can collect that data. We can build a model based on that data. And then when we run the model, we assume that the model uh, of the mouse is behaving just like the model of the human would behave, and we go from there. That, prevents us from having to uh, use humans as, as guinea pigs. Okay. Uh, physiological PK models can study how physiological factors can change drug distribution from one animal species to another. Uh, we don't need to do a whole lot of data fitting here. Um, it, it's more physiological based, so we actually look at the uh, what's happening in all these various tissue spaces. Uh, the drug concentrations in the various tissues are predicted by the size of the, the organ. Uh, how much blood flow is going into that organ, and some other experimentally determined drug uh, tissue blood ratios. And disease conditions or pathophysiological conditions can affect how things are di uh, distributed. So, for example, I have a, a PK model um, that uh, deals with uh, fluoxetine. I think you've seen that drug before. And what we do in the, the, this PK model is we remove a kidney, so we actually uh, uh, take in half the, the function of the kidneys in terms of uh, metabolizing and excreting uh, drug in the blood, and we see what the effect is of, of what happens if somebody loses a kidney. It's a pretty interesting model. Okay. Uh, here's a perfusion model. Uh, uh, that shows, or physiological model that shows lidocaine, which is an anesthetic, and notice we're doing this intravenously. So if you look at this chart here, uh, um, all of these PK models look at percentage of drug or concentration of drug over time. Um, notice that because it's IV, the drug is immediately in the blood and actually pretty quickly in the lungs. Uh, so, and then the drug in the blood decreases in the blood but notice how it, uh, over time it's increasing into some of the tissues like RET, uh, endoplasmic uh, tissues. Uh, notice what it's doing. Uh, it takes a little bit longer to get into the muscle. Uh, it takes even a little bit longer to get into the fat tissue or adipose tissue. 
And over time, a lot of the drug metabolizes, and after if I ran this model for a longer time, pretty much everything would go to zero, and everything would have been metabolized. So notice even injecting things intravenously, it goes directly into the blood, directly into the lungs, but it takes a little time for the, the drug to perfuse or to distribute into some of these other tissue spaces like RET or muscle. Um, a compartmental model is fundamentally what we're going to use here. We represent the body by a series of compartments that communicate reversibly with each other. So we have compartment number one here. Compartment number one may be the stomach. Uh, the drug goes into the stomach. It gets absorbed into compartment number two, which might be the blood. And notice there, there are rate constants. So you see a little K there. K12 means the rate constant by which, or the speed at which the drug in compartment one gets absorbed into compartment two. So that's what that notation there. And K, again, is a rate constant. It's a, it's a unit of time, um, how much drug gets absorbed from compartment one to compartment two. And these are all reversible reactions. If you studied that in, in chemistry, you understand a reversible reaction. So the drug uh, in the blood can go back into the stomach, and that happens at a rate called K21. And that rate will be significantly uh, slower than uh, going from uh, compartment one to compartment two. These compartment models can get very complicated very quickly. You notice there I've got a three compartment model. Um, I've got a couple PK models that have eight, nine, ten compartments. You'll see an example of that in the journal reading for this week. Um, compartment models are not real physiologic or anatomic regions, but there are tissues or groups of tissue having similar blood flow and drug affinities. So in the model you're going to build, we're going to assume that the stomach uh, has the same blood flow as actually the blood system, the circulatory system, the drug affinity is going to be the same. Um, within each compartment we assume that the drug is uniformly distributed. That's a really bad assumption, but we make that assumption so we can actually build the model. Uh, drugs move in and out of the compartments, um, and compartmental models are based on linear differential equations, and you'll get to see those here in a minute, so you'll get to see a little bit of calculus. And the most important thing here is the rate constants. These are used to describe the drug entry into and out of the compartment. You saw the rate constants there a minute ago, K12 and K21. Okay? Um, Compartmental models are typically known as open systems since the drug is eliminated from the system. Once the drug is eliminated, uh, the drug is gone. Uh, the amount of drug in the body is the sum of the drug present in all the compartments. So at some time, uh, some of the drug will be in the stomach, some of the drug will be in the blood, some of the drug will be in the liver. The total amount of drug in the body is the sum of those, all those compartments. Um, and extrapolation from animal data is really difficult to do because the volume isn't a true volume, but it's really a mathematical concept, something called a volume of distribution. Uh, we can determine some of the parameters uh, from uh, experimental data, and these are kinetically determined. So compartmental models are used to extrapolate to uh, human studies, but they're a little bit uh, uh, more uh, dangerous in terms of how well they extrapolate the data from animals to humans. Uh, mammillary models is, is sort of a variation on the compartmental model. Uh, again, you see a, an example here of compartments. In the top, we only have one compartment. So the, the drug is getting absorbed into the body at some rate, K sub A. It's getting eliminated from the compartment at some rate, K sub E L. E L means eliminated, A means absorbed. Um, Notice there, the next one down is a two-compartment model. Drugs coming in, it's getting reversibly moved from compartment one to compartment two. And notice that drug is being eliminated from compartment one, but not necessarily from compartment two. Uh, likewise, in the bottom one, you've got a three-compartment model. Uh, drug can come into or out of compartment one, and it reversibly moves between compartments two and three, respectively. Okay. Um, here's a nice picture that shows intravenous um, administration, the drug going right into the blood. Uh, that's the quickest, easiest way to get drug into the body. We don't have to worry about absorption uh, or any of those complicating factors. Intramuscular, you see the uh, drug being excreted in right in or administered right into the muscle. And subcutaneous, of course, is sub 
is, is right under the skin, and you see the little bolus, the, uh, that little green circle there is called a bolus, B-O-L-U-S. Likewise, um, you have a bolus going into the vein and a bolus going into the muscle. Okay? So that's a nice picture of the three routes of administration. Oral administration, I think you can probably imagine that without a picture. Um, Okay, uh, little differences here, if you look at intravenous uh, administration, we've got time on the x-axis and concentration in the plasma, plasma is another term for blood, okay. the concentration in the blood plasma over time with IV administration as you saw earlier, uh, the concentration uh, is at its peak immediately as soon as I inject the drug in, uh, my concentration in the plasma is the highest it's ever going to be. When I'm doing extravascular, oral, intramuscular, subcutaneous, something other than intravenous, it takes a little while for the drug to uh, build up in the blood plasma, so the concentration is delayed a little bit, and then it will uh, uh, decrease as the drug is distributed and eliminated. Okay? So these pictures show difference in plasma concentration time curves. Um, basically, your body is a big uh, bucket of water, so uh, there's a one compartment model where your whole body is the one compartment, so there's a picture before and after. Notice that as soon as you inject the drug, uh, the drug is assumed to be distributed uniformly all over the entire body, which actually doesn't happen. Um, one compartment, open model, um, intravenous administration. Here's the simplest picture. The one compartment model offers the simplest way to describe the process of drug distribution and elimination in the body. So the drug goes in, uh, there's a volume of distribution, well, we're talk of, which we'll talk about here momentarily, and then the drug is eliminated at some rate, uh, K sub EL. And when the drug is administered IV in a single rapid injection, the process of absorption is bypassed, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording at this point. Uh, there's more slides to do, but we'll do that in Part B, just so we make sure that the podcast isn't too large uh, to download and be able to view on the computer. So we'll see you back in a few minutes.